I'm Dr. Gloria Lattimore Peace, host and producer of OmniU Presents, the H3O Art of Life show. The title of this show is Wisdom for Life, Part 2. We had a Wisdom, Wisdom for Life, Part 1, and actually it was based on the conference that the uh, Comedic Institute, no, it wasn't the Comedic Institute, it was an association. For, you were the host, but the, it was the Association of for the Study of classical African civilizations that actually uh, uh, held the conference in Chicago not long ago. And the title of their conference was Wisdom Instructions for Life. And so we had uh, uh, Queen Nzinga and Mario Beatty and we had Saba Murti uh, Gentry to come on and to, to talk about that subject. Today we have one of the presenters Hunter Havlin Adams III, who is here to uh, talk further. And I, I, before I introduce, before I say something else, Hunter, I want to introduce Charles Grantham, who is, I just discovered, not only a professor at the Center for, Carruthers Center for Inner City Studies, but a, a public school teacher, but the author of a book called The Battle for Kemet. Right. So I'm just real thrilled to know about that today. I, and I got a copy, and so I will be reading it soon. But I wanted to, to say that, Hunter, when I read the topic that you were presenting, when I came to the conference and saw, you know, I always admire your scholarship anyway. Thank you. But when I saw the title of what, that you were dealing with, the topic, it just knocked me out. You, it, it was just, it was raising yourself. I'm looking for it in the, in the uh, yes. It's called Raise Yourself, the K Kemet Science of Salvation and Transformation. And I just want you to tell me right now how you came, <laughs> how you came up with that subject. Uh, well, you know, partly it goes back to uh, my mentor, um, someone who you know, Dr. John H. Jackson. Oh. Right. He gave a lecture at EPE, Institute of Positive Education, maybe... 15, maybe even 20 years ago. And he talked about um, the whole process of initiation at various levels of the priesthood in Kemet, or known as ancient Egypt. And, you know, through that lecture, it was so inspiring to me. And one of the things that he talked about as you get to higher and higher ele elevations, um, when you read texts, whether they're coffin texts, uh, that is um, speech written on coffins or inside of coffins, or the pyramid texts, or texts that were written on the walls of some of the early dynasty pharaohs, um, or even texts written uh, for common people uh, the, on stele, you know, the, these slabs of stone, which uh, now we know as gravestones, you know, mm -hmm. that whole idea of gravestone mm -hmm. came from Kemet. And so a couple of things he said was that, and it's written that even uh, chapter 125 of the book of going forth by day or going forth into light pejoratively known as the Book of the Dead because it was found um, in a tomb. So it was looked at, <laughs> this must have been for dead people. 
But, you know, when you really think about it a little, just a little bit, you say, wait a minute, but the dead person can't read it. Mm -hmm. And you discover that the texts were for the living as well as to aid uh, the deceased, but then they didn't even call them deceased. They called them imak, imak, which meant um, someone who has gone forth, right? So they didn't see the person, the essence of the person, as disintegrated. You know, it's, and it's different from the Western idea of soul. And that was one of the things that I talked about to make distinctions between um, comedic uh, ideas of personhood and Western and Asian ideas of personhood. You know, and because Westerners have interpreted, because they were the founders of a lot of, you know, the tombs and artifacts and so forth, their terms have stuck. But Professor Jackson, in reading some of these texts that have, were called mortuary texts because they were found in a cemetery, a mortuary, there was an admonition that stated, raise yourself, gather your bones, gather your flesh, stand up, right? That you've got to take charge for your own salvation and transformation. So that was the, the theme that I worked with in my presentation of giving some history, looking at 100,000 years of human spiritual evolution. Uh, there's a wonderful book, Difficult to Find, and um, takes effort to read called Instinct and Revelation by Dr. Alondra Oubre, a medical anthropologist who looks at brain development and other ev evidence to chart a history of human spiritual evolution going back 100,000 years in Africa. You know, before Kemet, before Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, Ifa, Dogon, you know, and so forth. She charts this. And so I was talking about this in my talk. So someone said, well, Hunter, where's the evidence of that? You know, you know, those people are gone. I said, well, the first space shuttle mission, Challenger, 1984, did infrared imaging of the Earth, and in particular, the Sahara Desert. And they discovered rivers, right? Remains of civilizations, 10, 20, 30,000 years old, under the sand, right? So before the Sahara was a desert, it was grassland and inhabited by thousands of people all over. The rivers were trade routes where people traveled from the west coast to the east coast, from the south to the north. And many of the major anthropologists disagreed with that. And so, but the evidence was there from the space shuttle. So how are you going to argue, you know, these deep imagings of the ground? And so some archaeologists, anthropologists, Fred Rendorf was one, and others did exped expeditions, and sure enough, they found remnants of societies under the sands of the Sahara. And others started doing, even before that, expeditions throughout the Sahara, and they discovered rock art. The rock art had images, um, you know, in Chad and Niger, you know, dated to 10, uh, 20,000 years ago. And the, arc, the rock art clearly is showing the development of those people's spiritual ideas, aspects of different, of consciousness, other than our everyday self. And so the art, you know, some surmise, uh, was used as educational tools to initiate the next generation into seeking their true essence. And so 
remnants or the, the core ideas in the art, you find traces of in comedic art, right? In the art of the Dogon and the Zulu and other people, other places. And so people had developed a whole, you know, I would call it a science of transformation where they use various means to get into novel states of consciousness, whether it was through uh, certain hallucinogenic plants like psilocybin mushrooms, or whether it was through ritual dancing to get in a trance like the Sufi Muslims still do with whirling der dervishes, you know. That what they were doing that, Gloria, 30,000 years ago, mm -hmm. you know, you know, spinning around, going in a trance, or whether it was through music, all those things combined, whether it was through ritual of being in a specific kind of ritual to take communities, not just individuals, but communities into those states. And so, you know, this existed before Kemet existed. And so Alondra Oubre, David Carl Colson's book, African Rock Art, um, provides strong evidence. And, and, these, and these were ways in which the societies were formed around um, knowing and discovering our essence, right? And so that was one of the first questions I asked in my talk right now, where is your essence, you know? And people, some people thought it was a rhetorical question. <laughs> but um, so it was Professor Jackson that put me on that track, um, you know, that led me to doing that talk. I mean, they can say more about it, but, you know, we got a you lot more. You will say so. more about it. <laughs> but I, I'm going to, I have to, have to, to uh, speak to Charles now about, you know, I know about Jacob's work because I was one of his students. In fact, I was his administrative assistant in one of the federally funded programs that was housed at Northeastern. And I know about um, intellectual warfare. I know about that. And you have a book called The Battle for Kemet. Mm -hmm. It sounds like the, an extension of the research. Is, it sounds very similar. So tell me how you came to write that book and in what ways is it like or different from the intellectual warfare uh, piece. Uh, thank you, and uh, it's, it's a great opportunity to be here on your show, and it's a great opportunity and an honor to be sitting here with you, Hunter. Hunter. Uh, actually, it is an extension, if you will, of uh, uh, Dr. Carruthers' uh, intellectual warfare in the, sen in the sense that uh, uh, the title, The Battle for Kemet, is taken uh, from his uh, book. He uh, helped come up with that name. Uh, and it's a continuation of the uh, battles that he's been go had been going through, not only him, but others in the uh, uh, African-centered movement. Uh, and so in it I have four essays, and the first one is called The Battle for Kemet. And uh, we came up with that, uh, first of all, the name Kemet. Uh, there's been uh, at, at one time a lot of flack about the uses of the the term Kemet when referring to ancient Egypt or Egypt in antiquity. And uh, we said, well, we try to, and at the center, we try to let Africans speak for themselves uh, as best they can. And here's the name Kemet. Kemet appears in, uh, uh, in the text, but it's always referred to as Egypt. And so we wanted to uh, explain why we use that term Kemet, that we stand on sound ground when we use the term Kemet when referring to uh, 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 ancient Egypt in antiquity. So that's the first thing, to establish that it is uh, legitimate, it's a valid name uh, that the people themselves use because it is in the text. Matter of fact, you can go to uh, uh, various tombs, uh, you can go to Ramesses the uh, second, the, the Ramesseum, that, where I took some photos, and you can see it written on the, uh, 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 the walls and some other places. So first of all, to establish that it was called Kemet, and more importantly, the definition of Kemet. Uh, Egyptologists and other uh, uh, white scholars have in to interpret the uh, term Kemet when they do accept it as meaning uh, a reference to the black soil. 
because we've all refer heard about how uh, uh, the now is the source uh, uh, that if it weren't for the now that there would be no, no, no Egypt, uh, wouldn't have been. And that's a fact, mm -hmm. no question about it. The inundations uh, helped water the uh, uh, place, uh, the, the valley, at, or people wouldn't have uh, been able to survive. However, the question is whether or not the people were referring to the soil when they named uh, that particular area Kemet, or were they referring to themselves as a people? And that's my argument. Uh, so what I did was looked at the uh, uh, looked at the, the glyphs or Madhu Nature, uh, and see, see how it was used, and look at the grammatical, uh, because there are grammatical rules uh, when you look at uh, Madhu Nature or hieroglyphs, just like in English or French or any other language. Uh, and these are rules that have been recognized by the Egyptologists. Uh, there are books that have been written by people like Alan Gardner. Um, uh, others uh, have been written, other grammar books and textbooks that we use, uh, and that's accepted and used by the uh, scholars. And by using those same rules, uh, we were able to show uh, that the people were referring to themselves as a black people uh, as opposed to the land. They had signs for land. Uh, if they if they had wanted to have said the black land uh, in reference to the land, they could have used that, but they didn't. Uh, the symbol that they use, uh, Kemet or Kim, means black. No one denounces that or, or will refute that. Uh, there's a, what's called a determinative, and that mm -hmm. sign that follows uh, uh, that adjective, if you will, of description is the term is the one that uh, the key term. And when we look at all the uh, definitions or how that particular determinative, which is like a round circle uh, with a at crossroads in it, and it's been defined as a crossroads, and all other uh, um, areas where that's been shown, that those particular places have been described as being cities, communities, towns, so forth and so on, uh, communities. So. The logical explanation from that would be then, if we look at it and read it the way that it was written, would be black community, black town, black city, uh, but not black land, okay? Uh, plus, uh, not too long after my book came out, uh, Emily Teter, who's an Egyptologist at the Oriental Institute, uh, which is the house we say that Breasted built, <laughs> uh, who was one of the early uh, white Egyptologists who was very Eurocentric in his way of thinking. But um, when she said if we were able to, or if it was able to reconstruct the inundation of the uh, uh, flooding of the Nile River like it was in antiquity, bringing all that rich silt from Ethiopia mm -hmm. and the highlands out of uh, uh, Southern Africa, what we would see is all this red soil being brought down uh, and being distributed over the land. In other words, the, the mud was red, not black, okay? So uh, we stand on firm ground, uh, like Sheikh Anta Diop, like uh, uh, Jake Carruthers and others. Uh, there are a number of uh, African scholars, uh, uh, Theo, Bill, Theo Philobinga, uh, as well as some others, who have shown that, that that's uh, the more logical uh, presentation and view of it, the black community uh, in reference to the people than to the uh, 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 to the so-called black soil, so that's that's the uh, first uh, uh, one that I have uh, uh, essay, uh, and that was a paper that I, I presented um, at a conference, ASCAT conference, and uh, then we later included that in in the Battle for Kemet. The second uh, one I have is uh, the uh, dealing with uh, will the real Champollion stand. Uh, Champollion uh, 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 is the father, so-called father of Egyptology, uh, which uh, was really in 1822. If it weren't for Champollion, then as it is now, we probably would be still struggling to read it, but he was able to help decipher it, along with a number of other individuals who were on the same uh, page, but he gets credit for being the father of Egyptology. Uh, but Unfortunately, before a lot of his works uh, were published, he did go to Egypt in 1828, 29, I believe, and, and visited Nubia and recorded a number of uh, uh, various sites and temples that he went into. And he also observed the people who were there and the Nubians. And so in a lot of his, in his journal, he kept a journal, um, which was later 
published by his brother, uh, Fijé, Champollion Fijé, or, uh, who changed some of the uh, imagery, who basically was probably one of the first people to, as far as I know, uh, who falsified uh, what the ancient Egyptians, how they viewed themselves. And uh, even his brother, uh, Champollion the Younger, uh, thought the ancient Egyptians were indeed an African people who looked like what we call contemporary Nubians did. But his brother uh, uh, changed that and sort of twisted it around. And so he was one of the first ones to lie. And other Egyptologists have taken that and run with it, making them to be white, okay? Uh, so that's the uncovering of, uh, uh, will the real Champollion please stand? Uh, you know, and again, it's just looking at who was really at fault uh, for doing this. Uh, another one is uh, uh, the um, un unwrapping of Egyptology, where I had a running feud with a Egyptologist at the Field Museum. Frank Yurko. Frank Yurko, where I've been, thanks, where I've been a, a docent uh, a tour guide in the Africa exhibit and the ancient, Inside Ancient Egypt exhibit for close to 15 years. Uh, he wrote an article in another uh, a magazine in, uh, Egypt is in Africa. This came out, I think, late 80s. Uh, and it, it followed an exhibit that was uh, in Indianapolis. And in it, he had images that had been used by people like uh, Ivan Van Sertima, Shek uh Jacob Carruthers, which showed that the ancient Egyptians and the Nubians were dressed in the same uh, clothing, the same black skin tone, and so forth and so on. In this, his particular article, he said that this was a, uh, a image that didn't exist, that it didn't exist in any tomb, uh, and he was basing this on a, a, a tomb uh, from Seti the first, the father of uh, Ramses the second, in which the Nubian is shown with a brown skin complexion. I'm sorry, the Nubian is shown with a black skin complexion, and the Egyptian is shown with a so-called reddish brown complexion, which meant that they were totally, you know, different. You know, as if black people mm -hmm. only come in one shade, right? You know, and so, so he said, uh, based on this particular uh, image in uh, the tomb of Seti the first, that it proved that uh, the ancient Egyptians, uh, the Kemites, didn't see themselves in the same vein as they saw the Nubians. Furthermore, he said that this, these particular images were put together, a, pas a pastiche, as he called, and that they didn't really exist in any tomb, and so. Uh, in 1987, uh, when ASCAC had uh, our, our national conference in Aswan, uh, Egypt, we were able, uh, on a side trip, uh, Jacob Carruthers, myself, uh, and a few other members of the Kemetic Institute, were able to go to uh, this particular tomb that uh, Frank Yorko said didn't exist, uh, which happened to be the tomb of Ramses III, uh, and uh, we had to uh, dash a little money. I think they call hmm. it bak bakshish. 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 Right. Uh, you had, we had to pay a little money, actually quite a bit of money, <laughs> to the guards to, to let us <laughs> and turn his head. Uh, we went in, we photographed these images that Frank Yorko said did not exist. Uh, and so that was a major victory when I came back. Although at the time I really didn't think too much about it. It wasn't until I read his article and tried to confront him with this, this information, uh, and he totally ignored me. It wasn't until a number of years later uh, that uh, I was able to again confront him. And uh, matter of fact, that would have been, he died in 2004. Yeah, that was shortly before his short, death. Yeah, that he admitted that he had been wrong, that the ancient Egyptians were indeed black, that they were the same people as the Nubians. Right. Uh, and that matter of fact that he had See been in the himself. That's quite, a, that's quite an admission. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, he didn't get a chance to retract the statement that he had written, but he did in front of my, to me, and uh, to, in front of two other members of the Comedic Institute at the Field Museum admit that he, mm -hmm. was, he w was incorrect. But later on, I he tried to play off the fact that race was unimportant. Yeah, well, he's married to a black woman and his children are mixed. And so he tried to play downplay and just everybody, we're just people, which I can understand, but as Jake would say, we didn't create the race problem. 
you know, we're not the ones who came up with the lie in the first place, stating that the ancient Egyptians were anything but black mm -hmm. or, or African. So uh, we felt that that was a, a, a big victory, uh, uh, that uh, Frank Yorko admitted that. And just the fact that, you know, the tomb exists and that people like Van Sertima, Ivan Van Sertima, uh, Sheikh Anta Diop, who use these images, are standing on sound scholarship. And that's mm -hmm. one of the things that ASCAC, uh, the Kemetic Institute, uh, we pride ourselves on, and it's not, it's just important that one be able to substantiate and validate th the truth. Well, you know, I think it's commendable and, and essential that scholars study for the community. You know, this, this whole idea, I mean, when you, you look at the European scholars, you know, they are statesmen. They are studying to advance the, 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 to the ideas and the values of, that correspond to their worldview. And it was very important to them that the most ancient people not be black. Of and course. so everybody seemed to have, all the scholars seemed to have devoted themselves to defending that point of view. And so we had to have somebody who was fully capable of doing the necessary research in order to disprove uh, these things and to bring truth to light so that we can you know, be about the business of being who we are and we, part of knowing who you are is knowing who you have been all this time. And that's a good point because in my presentation I had the cover of a 1911 issue of the Crisis magazine which you know we know is the flagship publication of the NAACP. Mm. And on the cover, first you had the title, Crisis, subtitle, Advancing the Race, right? And you had a drawing of Pharaoh uh, Taharka, I believe. Mm. And so it was dealing with Nubia. And people forget that about uh, Dr. Du Bois, that he did have um, a sense of Africanity within his consciousness. And um, it's, it's very important that you make, take these kinds of stance. And of course, you know, it comes with costs. You know, when you're going up against international institutions, right? You know, I did that uh, with my Portland Baseline essay, which was one of the things that um, Dr. Asa Hilliard um, helped um, strategize and create the series of essays dealing with African people's contributions from the past to the present in a number of different areas and I wrote the one on science and you know I came under tremendous vicious fire. assault symposia were held it held on me um, that the um, AAAS American Association for Advancement of Science two years in a row and um, Dr. Carruthers and Dr. Carl Spite and, and others came down there to defend me and when they had a chance to ask questions, uh, the uh, organizer whose name doesn't deserve mention <laughs> um, shut it down and he left. He just left the whole meeting. He disappeared. And so it comes with great costs when you stand up for what's right and what's true. And so, but, you know, in this presentation that I did, and there was many other very good presentations mm. at, at the conference, mm -hmm. um, uh, but since you got me on the show, I guess you want me <laughs> to talk about <laughs> mine. <laughs> uh, but um, one of the things, there's an absolutely wonderful picture from carving from Chad of two dancing women, um, kind of like whirling dervishes. And they have their arms up like this. And everyone knows in black community, your arms up like that, it's about giving praise. But the thing that's so amazing about this is that their faces are aglow, you know, of light. And there's a ball of light over their head. And that was something that was a clue. You know, when I asked the question, where was your essence? And I probably shouldn't give this away. 
<laughs> on your show. They need to come to a talk that I'm going to be giving somewhere soon in the future. But um, we're really ultimately luminous beings. And, you know, as I pointed out that, you know, we have so many identity problems. Everyone does. And we claim that we are this and we're that. You know, this ethnic group, that ethnic group. You know, we're from here, from the south side or the west side of the east coast west coast west coast folks are a certain kind of way and east coast folks are that kind of way and you know ethiopians are this way and nigerians and zulos and on and on and on and on but you know i asked people to consider this um at one point in time and even today people value blood that our life force, the animating force, is in our blood. And so sacri blood sacrifices are done, right? Sacrificing cows, chickens, and so forth, because folks think that it's the blood. It's in the blood. That that's it. But others will say, no. You know, it's ruach. In Hebrew, it means the breath, the breath of life that was breathed into you. And so that constitutes your essence. But, you know, we know that's just oxygen. It's a gas molecule. So are we going to reduce our essence to a gas molecule, of course, which is necessary for life, or are we going to reduce it down to our blood? But it's not our blood. We don't make the blood. We don't have no control over how blood is made, <laughs> right, in our bodies. We have no control whatsoever how any organ is made or functions. That's already predetermined, right? That which brought us into existence, God or creator, whatever name you want to give it, that's already predetermined. So we're not that. And I wanted people to think about their transformation, their salvation in an expanded light, not to disparage anyone's faith traditions, but we're in a time where we're blessed with, uh, this is a special period. Forrest Whitaker was here um, a few weeks ago, and he talked about what time do you wish you could live in, right? And a lot of people said, I wish I could be in a time when Jesus walked the earth, or when Akhenaten existed, or when um, Dr. King existed, for those who are younger. And he said, well, you know, those were wonderful times. Or when Buddha existed, you know, to sit at his feet and learn the secrets to meditation that we're still trying to grasp today. But he said that this is the period for him. He said, because there's infinite potential at this point that we have so much information. It just needs to be organized and synthesized and bring something new into being. That this is the millennium came eight years late, you know, because we were so into uh, Y2K, <laughs> you know, and so. It's, it's a great time, it's a great moment. There's so much that we can do if we could focus our attention. And so I had exercise to get people's attention to show them that, you know, they don't think. It's not think, easy to do. Yeah. That they don't think, you remember that. Yes, I do. Right, and you know, like the President of the United States, you know, he gives seven minute answers to questions and reporters say, journalists say, why you gotta take so long? You know, can he just give a snap answer? No. no, no he's no, trying no. to make people think. Right. Right? Because Americans tend not to think. They want everything microwaved in a nanosecond, not a millisecond. Here it is. Here's your answers right here. And this is going to work. In the next 30 days, boom. You know, economy is going to be solved. Well, the market is going to be back up to 14,000 again. You know, but it don't work like that. And so the same way that we, you know, for many people, 
it's um, spiritual mechanics, right? You just are in a mechanical mode of, if you want to call it serving God or worship, it's just mechanical that you go through it, whether it's Friday, Saturday, Sunday, or during the week, whatever it is, but to really, really penetrate and go deeper because, quote, spiritual development. I even don't like to use that word because it's too limiting. You know, the committee folks, they had 10 different dimensions of what a person is, and their name was one part of that, your name, which, which was really crucial. They had the ak, which meant luminous being or shining one or transfigured one. You know, Egyptologists tend to say, well, that occurred after death. But no, it also would happen during life if you engage in certain spiritual practices, discipline. Because I said that um, this is a, a lot of work on what takes to become an expert at anything, that the research says that it takes 10,000 hours to be a master at anything, the minimum of 10,000 hours. And so the Dogon of West Africa, their epistemology have gradations and um, <clears throat> so tiny, the third level, which was mastership, and there's eight levels to that. So they're talking about mastership mastership. And so part of your spiritual uh, journey is to become a master at that. Not just engage in the service per se, because every tradition, mm. whether it's the Christian tradition, the Islamic tradition, the Jewish tradition, they have the traditions that are reserved for those who really want to get to know and have a more intimate relationship with all that is, that with God, you know, they're mystical traditions. That's, uh, but, that's, that's interesting. Right. But, I would, just to piggyback on you, uh -huh. you know, we talk about master. Uh, while one may be that and one strives for that, I also like the fact that, you know, there's that uh, maxim that says, but no one can know it all. Absolutely. And, and, uh, and to be humble enough to know uh, that while you may be master, you know, may have studied and gather this information that there may be some so-called ignorant person, so-called, I use that term, or someone who may not be as wise as you, who may have just as much information or is just as knowledgeable in some other realm, uh, and to be humble enough to, to, to accept that, uh, that uh, learning, there is no limit. To There's it. no limit. There's no limit. It's ongoing. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, to talk about, you know, I use the metaphor of of uh, a butterfly that we tend to focus on, you know, that stage in its life when, you know, it has wings, but it starts off as an egg, then a larvae, and then it spins the cocoon around itself, and then at some point it'll burst through, right? Well, human beings do the same thing. We don't have the same hormones that result in a total exoskeleton change <laughs> as uh, that insect, uh, insect does. But what we do have is a consciousness that from our experience spins a web that becomes a cocoon and that cocoon is our egos, right? And that can be a hard shell to crack, <laughs> right? And so the disciplines were to shatter that shell, that ego itself, shell, you know, that's part of our life, but there's something known as our aliocentric self, which is our broader, more universal self that embraces the totality of everything simultaneously. But to, to experience that, you know, you may go to be out in the mountains and you see you know, huge mountains, so you feel quite humbled and small. And so you take all that in, or you're in a forest, and everything around you is alive. So that takes you out of 
your egocentric shell. And so that's what those disciplines uh, were meant to do, so that you are humbled by your experience. That's why the night sky was so important, because to, to look up at the night sky, <laughs> you know, hey, you know, um, marvel, that. It's, it's just something to see, but we can't see it too much, um, you know, in the city with, with lights. And so they would see themselves, they had an idea of themselves as, of their greater self, not their false self, as more than this, this flesh and bones and emotions, that we're not that. Ultimately, we're not that. That it's the experience that we're carrying but it's not us fundamentally at the core. But that's really hard. I mean, you can't intellectually, in fact, someone asked me that, well, you know, what's the purpose of going into the dark? You know, because they would go into the dark for, you know, three days, seven days, you know, or a month, total darkness. It's because that elicits uh, biochemical changes and changes in how your brain processes information and, and allows you to get more in touch with um, everything. And that's why, that's one of the training mechanisms uh, for initiates who want to become priests in the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. Because when I was there, we saw these holes in the wall at, where these 11 churches in Lali Bella were, and the guy said, well, that's where uh, the interns live for the next uh, seven to 10 years, in the holes in the wall. Right. And so it's for them. It's not I was called to preach. No, you got to work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you got to work. You got to sacrifice. You got to give up everything for them. And so that's why their communities have so much respect for them, because they know what those young boys went through to get there. Right. Still no girls. But um, and so that that's what I was trying to, to say in, in this short talk which was constrained by time, but nonetheless, um, that, that with all the neuroscience research and that even if someone is in hospice and they can't speak, um, I presented information that when their relatives are there at the bedside, it's important to say good things to the person, even though they can't move, they're in a vegetative state because they still can hear you. And so I showed slides from an MRI study that compared the brain of a person in a vegetative state who was asked to imagine playing tennis, hitting the tennis ball, and a normal person in the same areas of their brains became active. So even though the person was in a vegetative state, they heard the message, and they could understand it. So that's why our ancestors in the Nile Valley had 49-day rituals for the transition. Uh, in Tibetan Buddhism, it's called the Bardo state, 49 days, because it takes time for consciousness that's contained in that individual to completely disintegrate, right? And become unrecognizable to the person who's undergoing that transition. I mean, we as the living, we can't see that. You know, we don't have any access to it. But so science today is giving um, credence to these old ideas. And so that's why I say there's a science of salvation and transformation, so. You know, it makes you think about the mortuary sciences here in this part of the world, you know, just the, all the funerary practices. When someone dies, you know, generally speaking, there's a quick embalming and, and a hurry up, and then they have the, the service, the, the funeral service, and the interment, and then they go have the, the repast and people talk about moving on with their lives and what have you 
and very little, if anything, is done in our community after a person dies except to mourn. We don't think about the deceased as making a transition over time. We say the transition has been made. We say, you know, they have gone home as though the, the very act of, of, of ceasing to breathe and to right. be animated is all there is because when we don't encounter that in any any uh, in any yeah. way we don't no one preaches it from the pulpit and it it doesn't show up somewhere right yeah I think uh, again it's it's a process the, uh, the whole idea of being enculturated into someone else's culture and what their belief their value system is I think in traditional African spiritual systems or mm -hmm. how uh, death is viewed is totally different from how it's it's viewed here in the West. Uh, the fact that in, in probably the vast majority of our, our African s belief systems, uh, the, 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 while you may not, your love may not be physically on top of the earth with you, that loved one is still nonetheless with you, mm -hmm. especially as long as you remember and call their names. Uh, the whole thing about the, the body and cremation, I mean, Cremation is not something that African people traditionally d did or do mm -hmm. uh, here in America in the states because of economics, because of uh, again accepting someone else's uh, views. Yeah, we tend to uh, uh, will cremate, but that's just definitely not African. I think uh, Sheikh Anta Giap and others have shown that that's right. something that came out of a Eurasian uh, worldview. Uh, uh, because of the fact that they tended to be nomadic people and they wanted mm -hmm. to carry their, their, they still had respect and reverence for the dead, mm -hmm. but they, because they were on the move, they had to carry those uh, remains of their dead with them, so they cremated. Mm -hmm. Whereas African people tended to be more or less sedentary, mm -hmm. uh, and so they tended to bury. And their rituals, in some cases, last year, two years, they go back. Oh, sure. some Yeah, so I mean, it's not just the one shot, you know, even the, the ritual aspect mm -hmm. of it just uh, burying the body, mm -hmm. uh, there's more to it than that. Uh, the the, the so-called mourning, the, and it, mourning is a celebration of one's life. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the things that uh, we've gotten away from, you know. Uh, it's a celebration of life. You mentioned about right. people wanting to be, um, asked where they want to be in, t in, in uh, as far as time. You know, the right time is when you're here. Mm -hmm. This is the time that you're here. That's the only time. <laughs> the only time. Right. <laughs> Otherwise, you wouldn't have been put here. Mm -hmm. I right. mean, you're here f at this time for a reason. Uh, the thing that we have to do is uh, uh, pass that on to our children. Uh, and that's one of the things that ASCAC is about, uh, uh, pushing this. I mean, you can see with the presence of Hunter, uh, he, the, the types of individuals and scholarship that ASCAC is, is talking about. We want our children to see uh, there's more th to being uh, than to be, and not, nothing is wrong with being an MBA and, uh, or a doctor, but there are other professions that our children never even ever think about because they're never exposed to mm -hmm. it. Uh, anthropology, I mean, you know, Indiana Jones and all this is something that they see on television, but they don't imagine themselves mm -hmm. going into a tomb. I mean, we have Deborah Heard right. at the Orient Institute, mm -hmm. uh, who's right. been to Sudan on excavations. Mm -hmm. I mean, she can tell you some of the same type stories. I mean, uh, I'm sure a uh, hunter, maybe yourself, uh, myself, have crawled up into various tombs and temples that you later wonder about and say, gee, I wonder if I, you know, should I have done that? But the thing is, you did it for a reason. Mm -hmm. And we want to ex uh, uh, expose our children to that. Uh, you talk about education. Mm -hmm. uh, it's important that our culture, I mean, we've lost so much. And who's, who better, uh, not that we're the only ones that can go back and research it, but it's incumbent upon us to research our own. And so mm -hmm. it's uh, that aspect of it, uh, the number of other individuals who You're are doing great research. Great presentations at this great, year's very good. anniversary yeah. conference. From Howard, from the center mm -hmm. right. as well. Uh, uh, Jamie from the University of Michigan, the, yeah. And so youth are following, uh, and that's one of the, the uh, I think one of the strong points of uh, ASCAC is to bring young people in. And uh, as Jake would say that, uh, intergenerational transmission Transfer, of transmission. knowledge. Mm -hmm. it, if we don't do it, mm -hmm. how do we, and why should we expect anyone else to do it? That's the problem. We've allowed others to 
put information out there and give them education and values that are not our values. Mm -hmm. And so when you accept someone else's values, then you begin to think in the way they think. You can mm -hmm. no longer think the way you're no longer you. Mm -hmm. I think uh, Bobby Wright coined the term mental side. Mm -hmm. right. You know, we're all suffering from some forms mm -hmm. of mental side. I think if you know that you're suffering from it, you can sort of <laughs> right. uh, at least try to reverse the situation or, you know, you've identified. Unfortunately, too many of us don't know that we're even suffering and that we're following in somebody else's footsteps and uh, they're not ours. And so uh, how can you expect uh, the education system and the values that have been set up by people who have basically oppressed you uh, to be looking out in your best interest. One of the examples I give in my class, talking about spirituality and things like that, if, uh, which is something that was told to me when I was in Africa, is that a lion gets up in the morning, prays uh, to its deity or whatever, its creator, and says, give me the strength and courage to go out here and be fast and catch this gazelle or whatever to bring back food to sustain me and my family. And that's, that's fine. He goes out into the savannas. On the other side, you have a gazelle. Gazelle wakes up in the morning and says, you know, uh, look, I praise its deity and says, look, give me the strength to be swift, speed, you know, I can jump and curve and switch so that I won't become the food of some lion or some jackal or, or cheetah. And the question then becomes, comes down to then, what does the deity look like that the gazelle is praying to? Does it look like the same one that the lion is praying to? Okay. I mean, it's just something to think about. I mean, there's no answer, but I wouldn't think that the gazelle would be praying to a <laughs> lion god because the lion, the god for the lion or the creator for the lion is looking out for the best interests of the lion. And so when it comes to the education that we have uh, allowed ourselves to be, uh, become involved in or our spiritual systems or whose spiritual system, whose education are we, you know, uh, imbibing? You know, is it for our benefit or is it for the benefit of the other? An important aspect of that, that's, that's good, is how things are framed. Like when Egypt is in the news, it's as, oh, another tomb was found. Oh, we just found the tomb of Cleopatra and Mark Anthony. Uh, oh, we found another pyramid. But that wasn't them. You know, they never talk about the moral and ethical systems that they had or Ma'at. Mm -hmm. They don't talk about governance. They, talk, they don't talk about how did people manage these huge building projects, you know, to build temples or pyramids were massive projects. They weren't built by, quote, slaves. Correct. You know, you know there were no slaves. You know, they didn't even have, they didn't have a word in Medu Necher for slave. They had one for work, but not what we understand in the Roman system as a quota slave, because there really were no slaves anyway. Those were Slavic people, but that's a whole that's nother subject. Right, right. <laughs> but it's important that, that we bring to the table a discussion on the moral and ethical practices because it was how to live life, how to live, how to live as best you can given the circumstances, a life where you generate goodness and can experience happiness to some degree despite, you know, the Diversity. conditions that you Well, everybody's you know. got condition. I think the, uh, the ideal uh, man or person was one of peace. Right. Uh, when you look at the instructions of Tahotep, right. uh, it talks about peace. Exactly. Uh, that how you're supposed to act. Uh, and one, there was a hierarchy. Nobody denies that, that there was a hierarchy. But how one should address someone who happens to be your superior. How you should address someone who happens to be your peer or someone who happens to be uh, less fortunate to you. The thing is, there was always that uh, idea that one should try to get along and uh, not belittle someone, uh, not to blow yourself up as being right. greater than what you were because, hey, tomorrow you could be, you know, on the bottom. Uh, uh, so that whole idea, uh, you know, and material, yeah, there's no question about it. Yeah, uh, I'm sure like today, th but that wasn't the, that wasn't the end and all uh, uh, because one thing about obtaining wealth was so that you could distribute wealth. 
okay? Mm -hmm. uh, you want to be remembered. You acquired friends. How do you acquire friends? By giving them things and, and making people like you, making like them want to be Food to wanted. the hungry. hungry, water to the thirsty. Clothes to the naked. These right. are things that Shelter you want. Shelter for yeah. the homeless. So we talk about wisdom, uh, instructions, instructions for, for life. life. Sabiet I mean, M. Ak. Yeah, that's important. Uh, and these are things that when we talk about, why did they build these tombs? Yeah, it was the house, but, but it was something uh, to last forever and that uh, what they stood for, again, was something for eternity. And right. so building for eternity, uh, I think uh, the whole thing about the essence of the individual, you know, you try to practice that so that it'll last. Physically, you may not be here, but your essence, uh, what you did, will last forever. I, I just don't understand why an hour doesn't have 60 minutes in it, <laughs> but this one didn't. <laughs> <laughs> and we've got like about one minute to go. I want to be able to say, though, that the Comedic Institute regularly has classes down at the Carruthers Center for Inner City Studies, and that number is 773-268-7500. Right. And I want to know... Uh, you're going to be doing another presentation sometime, you say, within the next two to three weeks somewhere. Not well, it'll be somewhere. I, I just did the same thing in Detroit this past weekend. Okay, so I have a phone number, 708-257-7325, and if, when you find out where you're going to be, if I you sure let me time. know, sure. anybody who calls me, I'll put your name on a list, and I will be sure to let you know when Hunter Haviland Adams the third will be presenting because you have just gotten just a superficial uh, layer of this today in the in this limited time we've had. But I I thank, I thank you, you so much for coming and both of you for Charles Grantham and I thank you so much for coming, uh, Hunter. It's just been a pleasure to sit here and to listen to you and you just open up so many things that we need more information about. We need to dig deeper. And I, I just appreciate you so much. I appreciate well, we, you. We Thank appreciate you, very you much. for giving us the opportunity to, to share with the audience. Well, th this is it's my pleasure. I really have enjoyed you, and I'm sure that the audience has enjoyed you as well. And I, I look forward to your presentation, so I'm sure you'll let me know. And yeah, my sure website will. is GloriaJPeace at Yahoo.com. So I welcome your emails, and I'll certainly keep you in touch with these two gentlemen. And let me know about what you think about my book. Oh, I will. <laughs> I will. I'm sure I'm going to like it because, you know, your mentor. You it's see, good. I have such respect for, for Jake and such respect for Dr. John G. Jackson. Who you know, I, I didn't know he was your mentor because he was, such, he was so heavyweight. Not a lot of people hmm. could be his mentee. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> he would talk about you, too. <laughs> yes, he would. Up there yeah. Catfish Digby's <laughs> in the upper room. <laughs> yeah, but those were some great days. Right. Once upon a time, we had our land, our culture, and our mind.